Welcome to CIA Contagious Influencers of America. Well, we've all had bad days, right? Well, author and speaker Gary Miracle could have more than most since he lost both arms and legs to an infection. He is choosing grace and hope instead. Since, since the moment I found out that this was what was going to be the outcome to me and my body specifically, and I just wanted to do whatever I could do to make sure my story wasn't gonna go in vain. This is CIA Contagious Influencers of America. I'm David Sands. Now you may have seen him on the uh, music video that Mercy Me put out and what a video it was. It garnered some 5.7 million views and that was the uh, Say I Won't music video. And uh, boy, is this guy that we have today, what a motivational force he is. And his last name is truly Miracle. We have Gary Miracle with us. And, uh, you know, this guy survived a medical emergency because he got an infection that caused him to lose his arms and legs. But now he's encouraging others to find purpose, faith, and hope in the midst of adversity. He has a book out called No More Bad Days, Trading the Pursuit of Perfection for the Gift of Grace. Let's get to my interview with Gary Miracle. Gary, welcome to the homestead. Thank you so much, man. It's great to be here. Um, so, uh, first of all, you were blessed with a great last name. Your dad's here today. He is. Yeah. <laughs> the man behind that's the not, miracle. That's not, that's not your uh, stage name. That's that your real not, name, right? Okay, you must have heard. It is not my amputee <laughs> stage name. That is, uh, it is God gave me that. Uh, like it or not, I guess, at this point. But, yes, that is my real name. Uh, I've even had to show people my driver's license to prove it because they don't believe me, but <laughs> it is my real name. So uh, t take me back to your uh, childhood. Yeah. Uh, are you from here? I am not. I am from Florida. Florida, okay. Uh, I, was, I was born in Michigan, Pontiac, Michigan. I lived there till I was 10, so I, I don't remember that too, too much. I moved down to Florida. Dad's job took us down there when I was 10, so I consider Florida home where I'm from. That's what I remember, but we are still there in Central Florida, um, dodging hurricanes this week. But we are there and we love it there for like three weeks a year. It's beautiful outside of that. It's blistering hot, so we don't go too many places, but Florida is home for us. And uh, so, so tell me about uh, what life was like growing up. Yeah, goodness. You know, I, I consider my life growing up what most people would consider kind of growing up in the all-American family. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so proud and honored to say that, you know, after 40-something years, I don't know how many years, but my parents are still happily married. Uh, they appear to be, at least. Uh, <laughs> but now no, they're happily married. Um, we have a, a great family. My sister is one of my very best friends on this planet. She's four years older than me. And we just grew up. We grew up in the church. I grew up playing sports. My dad was at all my sporting events. We we were very active in the community. We were we were doing what what we wanted to do and needed to do. Like it was we were living the dream, really, at the end of the day. You know, I grew up, I had had one of those lifestyles where there was really nothing that I needed. You know, hundreds and millions of things that I wanted, but you know, nothing that I needed. I was I was so well taken care of and so well loved and and had great opportunities and doors open for me and things were just moving along so perfectly. And then God takes us to this point. Uh, now you were an athlete, right? In school? I tried to be, yes, I was, I played. I, I played, uh, I love sports. I'm an extremely competitive person. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the hardest things right now in my life having to, to deal with, but yeah, played sports all of my life. and. You know, I, I, I played football and basketball, but eventually when, when the music kind of went away and when I was in high school, I ended up running and, and I ran track and cross country. And that's kind of where I, I found my, my home in sports. Uh, it was one of those, I, I tried to be all of my life 
kind of whoever I needed to be with whoever I was with. I always needed to be the the funny guy, the fast guy, the cool guy, the good looking guy, you know, all those things. And, and track and cross country gave me that opportunity because it was a team sport with individual race. So I got my individual accolades while helping the team. So it was very self-serving for me and very selfish, you know, in, in many ways, but, but I loved doing it and it was a lot of fun and mm-hmm. I was able to run and, you know, had a, a small scholarship offer after high school to go to college and decided to go another path, move out to Dallas, Texas and take a job out there working for a ministry. But I did play sports all of my life and still do as much as I can, um, depending the sport, I guess, mm-hmm. what I can do. But I do love all of that and I, and I am surrounded by it constantly. And now I'm a dad that gets to be out there like my dad was with me and I'm still either in my wheelchair or on my prosthetics coaching my kids soccer teams and football teams so trying to pick up where where my dad left off with me which is a beautiful thing so so why did you uh decide to go into ministry going back to what i had just mentioned i i I wanted to be all things to all people and i felt like i could get a lot of affirmation for choosing to go into ministry I did it for the accolades. I did it for the, wow, Gary, you're amazing. Um, I did it for the cheers of pretty much anybody who would, who would talk to me, um, who would, who would want to, you know, give me an ear to listen that, you know, this 18 year old kid is deciding to forego college and move out to Dallas, Texas, where he knows anybody, but he's going into full-time ministry. So let's pray for him and let's bless him and let's encourage him and, and do these things. So it, it filled that tank that love tank inside of me that that I so desperately searched all of my life that that desperate need for affirmation and this colossal fear of rejection that I had mm. so you put those together and I needed to do something that not many other people were doing because it made me stand out and mm-hmm. made me look better than I well it did make me look better than I thought I was but like it it showed that I was trying to do something different than other people going against the grain and that, and that made me stand out and it, and it got me those accolades and that affirmation. So, so how did that work out for you? Uh, not great. <laughs> you know, that it's the, it's the beauty of Christ is that, you know, you, Jonah can only run so far away, right? You know, I, you know, he can only he can only try as hard as he can to to do his own thing and to make his own plans, and and that's what I was trying to do, and I was chasing that. All I wanted to do is be perfect for everybody, and um, and and it all caught up to me. I don't know that I've met a person in this globe today that hasn't done something you know right wrong sinful not that just hasn't been exposed and you know at the end of the day through my chasing of the cheers of everybody that i was you know in front of i eventually got exposed in all, in all of my areas because i was a different person i was i was what i considered a chameleon like i was i would change who i was mm. and, and and i i got exposed in many ways and and my my go-to uh, I would say my go-to resolution to me getting exposed was to run away and to start over. So I would say I lived in Florida. I've lived in Texas. I've lived in Michigan. I've lived in Kentucky. I lived in Arkansas for a little stint. And every single one of those moves, I was running away from something because I didn't want to face the reality of the life that I had lived and the choices that I have chose to make so in order to man up face those dead on and own it and grow and mature and who i was it was easier for me to run away and start over where nobody else knew me Mm -hmm. and i could try to be that guy again that i always tried to be for the life leading up to that point too Mm -hmm. it was a lot it was a lot to keep up with Mm -hmm. it was a lot to remember who i was when i'm with you and it's a lot to remember who i was when i was at church or who i was when I was at the parties on Friday nights in high school or who I was, you know, when I was just hanging out with my friends or, or with the track team, you know, it, it was a lot of different masks that I, uh, grow, grew accustomed to wear through the better part of my life. So uh, tell me about, uh, how you, uh, your relationship with, uh, mercy me. Yeah. 
So that was uh, where I went in 2000. I graduated high school in 2000 and, and took a job with a, a ministry called Shepherd Ministries. They were based in Irving, Texas. Um, and worked for them. They held student conferences every weekend throughout the school year. Uh, and so I was in a different city every single weekend. Loved it. Mm-hmm. Like you know, 18, 19 years old, and I'm traveling for a living, putting on these student conferences. Well, at that time, there was this no-name Christian band called Mercy Me, who happened to be the worship band for the student conferences while we were traveling around that year. And, and I just got to know those guys every weekend through that year. And that was also the year that they signed their first record deal. So they got a record deal, signed with a label and a manager, and they were in need of bringing on their first employee. And here I was. So they brought me on as their merchandise guy. So I hit the road with them and I got to be on the road for 220 days a year and sell t-shirts for Mercy (laughs) Me. And like, how cool is that? Like, Mm -hmm. that's what I got to do. You know, when I was 20 years old, I'm on the road with this band. I can only imagine, I think if you've ever been to a funeral, you've heard that song or (laughs) ever turned on any radio station kind of thing. But you know, it was just one of those surreal moments where I was, I'll never forget. I was walking through Walmart one day and my cell phone rings and it was Bart and he was like, Hey, uh, we just signed a record deal. Wondering if you'd be interested in working with us and hitting the road. And I was like, okay, I'll I'll be there tomorrow. Like, is is that cool? Or yesterday? Would would that work for you? Uh, But that's how that relationship began. And um, August 3rd of 2001, I flew out to Dallas, Texas, because I was at home for that summer. And they picked me up in the tour bus and we left from the airport and went straight to Glorieta, New Mexico for a one week summer camp down there and just hit the ground running and I sold some shirts. So what was, what was that like being on the road with the, with the guys? It was amazing. You know, to be a 20 year old guy doing something like that was, was incredible. The, the experiences I got to be a part of the people that I got to meet. I mean, you know, one of my, one of my first opportunities was their record release party, you know, that they had here in Nashville, you know, in downtown and one of the high rises. And we were on one of the top floors and, I remember going on this elevator and just going up and, and, and it opening it up. And it was all of like the who's who in the Christian industry from the late nineties when I was growing up. And now I'm, I'm in a room with these guys from the newsboys and DC talk and, and mercy me. And these guys that I've just listened to and, and grew up playing the drums, you know, and, and worship band their songs. And now I'm in a room with them and it, you know, you just kind of sit back and like, this is, this isn't real life. Like this is surreal to be able to have this opportunity. Um, and who knew, you know, 23 years later, you know, we would be in this position in our, our relationship. Not that that ever went away. They've been a part of my life ever since that day. They've been through it with me through thick and thin and in the good times and the bad times. And, um, I, I, I tease them quite a bit that, you know, it, it cost me an arm and a leg just to get them to write a song for me. So it's, uh, I give them that all the time, but we have a great time together. So it's, it's, it's a great relationship. That'll be a lifelong. So, so tell me about that song. So I got out of the hospital. <laughs> Sorry. Can you edit that out? <clears throat> so about three years prior to this medical journey that I embarked on, I went through what I would call a little bit of an identity crisis. I had realized, you know, growing up in the church, you know, I talk about my family foursome quite often and how great it was, but I never was forced to realize or, or, or have the thoughts of like, who am I? Like I, I, I say often, like I took on the faith of my parents and I think a lot of Christians do that, you know, in their early ages. And I realized, and I was about 34, 35 years old that 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 was me and and I was sick of running and I was sick of hiding and I was sick of trying to keep up with who everybody thought I should be or shouldn't be, whatever the case may be. So I remember reaching out to Bart from Mercy Me and and talking to him about it and being like, Bart, man, I'm in, I I don't know who I am. I, I don't know who I am. I don't even know who God is right now in my life according to what I'm doing and where I'm at. And he, and he had just gone through a similar journey, you know, of, of just learning about grace and identity and, and who we are. So, 
So he linked arms with me and, and he told me about this book, uh, this book called The Cure, written by uh, this author. His name is John Lynch. And he wrote this book about identity and grace. And Bart walked through that book with me and, and we walked through it together and we would call each other and we would text each other often. And, and, and through that, I really got to understand who Christ was you know, in, in my feeble mind of still trying to understand that to this day and wrap my mind around that, but to really understand who Christ was, but more importantly, who I was in Christ and, and how I fit into his story. Um, so walking through that and then going through this medical journey, I don't know that I would be mentally where I'm at today had Bart and I not walked through that journey together prior to this happening. So then this happens to me and then I, and then I rewind to, I get out of the hospital and it was in October of 2021. Bart calls me again. He's like, Hey, we just wrote a song. Uh, we, we just want you to hear it. So I'm like, okay, I'm sitting on my couch at home in Florida. So he, he text messages me this song and, and I listen to it and I am a blubbering mess the whole time because it's just resonating with me, but I don't really know why. I just knew that it was powerful and it meant something. And, and I call him back and, I'm crying on the phone and he's like, what'd you think about it? And I'm like, that's all I could say at the time. And he's like, you know, I, did you pick up on anything in that first verse? And, and there are two lines in that first verse that were actual text messages between Bart and I from when he and I walked through that book together years mm -hmm. prior to that. So he had written that first verse, you know, you know, looking at life through a whole new set of lenses and driving 35 with a rocket inside. I didn't know what I had, you know, the, those, those two lines were, were things that he shared with me that we were also walking through in that book. And, and then I go through this medical journey and, and Bart will share, you know, it was very difficult for him to come to the hospital to see me, or it was very difficult for him to look at pictures of me while I was in the hospital. You know, he, 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 it was, it was a sight to see, you know, mm. if, if you don't have the, the stomach for some of the things that was happening to me and my body. But, but then Bart took that and, you know, wrote the rest of this anthem of a song called say, I won't. And then said, we wrote the song and it's just a fight song for you. And we want to know if you would trust us enough to tell your story in the music video for the song. And, and I, I don't know exactly word for word what I said, but, but it was along the lines of, you know, since, since the moment I found out that this was what was going to be the outcome to me and my body specifically, and I just wanted to do whatever I could do to make sure my story wasn't going to go in vain. So whatever door Christ was going to open for me, I just, I just wanted to bust through it and, and give him the glory and make sure that he was the center of attention because, and I going through that grace identity crisis that I went through, you know, I realized that it doesn't matter who I am or it doesn't matter what you think of me or what anyone thinks of me at that point. Like Christ is crazy about me and I'm going to own that. And I want to love that. And I want to tell people that. And then I want to look at people dead in the eyes and I want to tell them that Christ is crazy about you too. Whether you know him or not, he's madly in love with you. And, and knowing that I wanted to make sure that Bart had that understanding and you know, just making sure that my story wasn't going to go in vain. And then it was a whirlwind. Two weeks later, I'm on an airplane. I'm up here in Nashville at the steel mill at the studio and, and we're shooting. We did the entire video shoot in one day uh, in, in November. And then it hits YouTube December 4th of 21. And it's just got millions and millions of views and it launched us into this platform. And before you know it, I'm trying to figure out how to hold a cup and take a drink fast enough so that I can get to my iPad to zoom in onto Fox and friends for an interview. And I'm like, it's just can't be real life. Like this is this, I'm trying to figure out how to survive right now, but I'm also put on this national platform that I've just been launched into. But I am a firm believer that God just doesn't make mistakes and he didn't mess up on this. So being able to have the ability to be here and to just be alive and to, to be okay and to be a dad to my boys and a dad to my daughter and a dad, a stepdad to my stepkids and, and my, my new beautiful wife and just the things that he's allowed me. It's hard for me to go through 
many days having conversations with my kids where I just don't look at them and be like, oh, I'm just so thankful God kept me here to be your dad mm-hmm. and kept me here to, to watch you grow up and, and to know these things and then just to hug them and love them and squeeze them a little tighter. And, and that, that's, it's, it's been a lot. And that was a really long answer to your question about the Mercy no. Me song. So uh, that's how it kind of birthed from. It was Bart and I's conversation five years ago. And then he wrote that anthem of a second verse and a bridge to that song. And, you know, it's, it's become a lot of people's fight song these days. Well, we're going to step away for just a minute uh, from my uh, interview with Gary. Hi, I'm Jackie Dorman. Are you longing for your soulmate? And maybe you've tried everything and you feel like nothing is working. You've done the online dating, the singles ministry, possibly even the dreaded blind dates set up by well-meaning family and friends. And you're starting to wonder, where are the truly Christian men that want to seek me out for a committed, loving relationship without the head games? Well, I'm here to help. I want you to join me for my free Married in 12 Months Challenge, where I'm going to show you all the tools you need to step into the love story that God has already written about you. I'm gonna teach you about why now is your time, why God wants you married even more than you wanna be married, what are the lies that are holding you back, the law of attraction that's biblical, and what are the tools to stepping into that bride that you wanna become. So join me at lovestories.com for my free Married in 12 Months Challenge where we'll get you out of the waiting room and into the love story that you've been dreaming of. Join me at lovestories.com. I hope to see you there. Let's now get back to my interview with Gary Miracle. So what led up to this? What happened in 2019? December 26, 2019, I got sick. Uh, it was flu season in Florida. I think it was flu season probably everywhere. Uh, even one of my kids in the house had the flu. And I got the flu and uh, it was in that goofy time of year, you know, December 26. So it was in between Christmas and New Year's, you know, where your doctor doesn't hold regular hours, your primary doctor. So I drove myself to the emergency room and they asked me a series of questions. They chalked me up to, okay, you have the flu. So they gave me a Tamiflu shot, steroid shot, and sent me home and gave me the whole, hey, if you're not better in 10 days, come back and see us again. Uh, the next day I woke up and I was feeling much, much worse. And I, I drove myself back to the emergency room and I ended up having an allergic reaction to the Tamiflu shot they gave me the day before. So they gave me a different steroid shot to counteract that sent me home, gave me the whole, hey, if you're not better in 10 days, come back and see us again, drink lots of water, get a lot of rest kind of thing. Um, And then on December 31st, New Year's Eve, uh, 2019, I took myself back to the emergency room for the fourth time. Uh, So for the fourth time, and they they looked at me this time, and they instantly admitted me, and they rushed me back. And at that time, my body was falling into multi-system organ failure, and I was falling into septic shock. So they were putting me into an induced coma all the while looking at my family, telling them that they needed to call the rest of my family and friends to come in and say goodbye to me. Cause they didn't think I was going to make it through the night. Um, they actually gave me a 1.7% chance to live through the night. Um, I always wondered, I don't know why they couldn't have given me like a 2% chance. I don't know, you know, who, who, who in a cubicle was like one per seven, like, yeah, that'll work. Uh, but it was, I, it was the shirt you're, you were wearing. It had to have been. It had to have been. So they gave me that. And, you know, I, I, was, I was laying there at 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve 2019, one hour before everybody on the East Coast was celebrating Happy New Year. And I'm laying on a hospital bed waiting for a helicopter to come get me to take me to, from one hospital to another to put me on life support. Uh, the hospital that I was at didn't have the form of life support that that we thought I needed. So I was, I was airlifted to another hospital in Orlando, Florida and rushed into their ICU unit. This was around now, I would say one or 2 AM on January 1st, 2020, the the best year of all of our lives. Right. Uh, So I'm a very competitive person. So I just got a head start on 2020. So all of our (laughs) lives, I just wanted to beat everybody to the punch. So, they rushed me into the ICU unit around 1, 2, 3 a.m., uh, hooked me up to all the different machines. I think I was hooked up to some 40, 46 different machines just pumping lines into my body, trying to look at, trying to do anything for me. And they looked at me and looked at my family and once again confirmed, you know, the 1.7% chance to live. I'm like, why is he here? This guy's minute by minute. We're, we, we're at the end of our rope. We don't know what to do with him. 
And my family told him, well, we're here because you have an ECMO machine is the name of the, the form of this life support machine that, that I wanted to be on. And, and while they told them that, the doctors looked at my family and said, well, he's not a candidate for that machine. So it was very confusing why we would go through all of that just to not be a candidate for it. Um, the side note, the reason I wasn't a candidate for the ECMO machine is it's a form of life support that people are put on after they receive a heart transplant or a lung transplant. Well, I didn't receive either one of those. So on paper, they were right. I was not a candidate for it. Um, so they, they gave my family that we're going to make them as comfortable as possible, uh, but we don't know what's going on. And if you know much about hospitals, you know, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. every day are shift change times. So 7 a.m. rolls around January 1st. The new day shift regime comes clocking in. And the first thing they do when you clock in is you make your rounds. You, you check to see what patients you have for that day. And, and you get the update from the night shift about who's got what going on. And they were all on my uh, the, the foot of my bed in the ICU unit. And they were making their rounds and in unison, every machine that I was on just did the one long beep. And at 7, 18 AM on January 1st, I was just laying on the hospital bed lifeless. And um, they said it looked just like out of the movies. My whole body turned blue within about 30 seconds. Code blue started going over all the loudspeakers. Other doctors and nurses started coming in. This little 70 pound nurse jumps on top of me and just starts King Kong in my chest to try to bring anything back. And uh, they, they were getting to the point that, you know, at, at some point you just kind of got to stop and let go. And, and they were getting to that point. But 11 minutes later at 7.29 a.m., one of the nurses looked at one of the machines and they found a slight pulse. Um, so they ran out to my family and they said, listen, we found a slight pulse. And the cardiothoracic surgeon that was on clock at the time said, we still have no idea what we're going to do with this guy. We're still minute by minute, but I'm going to throw up a Hail Mary and put him on something called the ECMO machine. So everything started making sense for us at that moment, why I was there. So they rushed me into surgery to put me on the ECMO machine. It was about a five or six hour surgery. And they ran the new lines into me, into my body, into my heart. And, and the way the ECMO machine works is it takes all of the blood and all of the oxygen and all of the circulation from your body and it pumps it into your core to keep your organs running strong while your new heart or your new lungs kick in because mm -hmm. of the transplant, which I didn't have again. But it took everything from my extremities and pumped it into my core. Most people are on the ECMO machine for about 24 hours, 48 at most, you know, after they receive a transplant because doctors are pretty good at what they do. Um, I happened to be on the ECMO machine for 10 days while I was in my coma from January 1st until January 10th. So mm -hmm. for 10 days, my arms and legs weren't receiving any blood or oxygen or circulation, and they just started dying. Um, so my family had to make the choice on my behalf when I was in my coma, do I lose my life or do I lose my limbs? And, and they looked at the doctors and said, we'll take them back however you can give them to us. So mm -hmm. we made the choice to, to lose my limbs at that time and, and see what God's going to do with it next. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. So, um, and th this, this decision was made with the, uh, with the, uh, after the, 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 uh, staff changeover. Correct. Okay. This was that decision. So it was like getting a second opinion in a way. Essentially, yeah. It, it was getting the second opinion. And, and you know, they could have made me as comfortable as possible, like the, the night shift had said. Yeah. And we could have just played this out. And there would have been a really good chance that this conversation would not be happening right now, you know, had that been the case. But, you know. It's, but, so, it's so strange how that happens because years ago, 2009, I had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they rushed me to the hospital, and the the, uh, the doctor said, "Oh, he'll be fine." Blah blah blah, you know. Yeah. And and, and this guy was obviously uh, he he was probably a doctor for fifty years. He had a lot of experience. And then they had a shift change. Okay. And this new young doctor came in who was it looked like he was twenty, <laughs> and he says, uh, "We're going to do a spinal tap on that guy." And they did not. They found that I was bleeding, and I had him, you know. Aneurysm and a stroke, and uh, they rushed me in an ambulance to. But it, it was once again, it was a shift change. Yeah, <laughs> and and it is, and and you know, you never listen. I doctors and nurses are heroes, you know, and you know, nine hundred and ninety nine times out of a thousand, they got it right. With, mm -hmm. You know, with that, I I'm the one that 
didn't go the right way with. So, yeah. but, but they, they do. And, you know, I think about that and, and I have all the grace for that night shift team in the world, because again, I, I, I truly believe God didn't make a mistake on me and he knew this was going to happen to me long before my sorry self was even a thought in this world. And so, you know, to think about them in a negative light or to, to hold a grudge towards them or bitterness or anger, you know, at the end of the day, a, a very small dose of amoxicillin would have knocked this out and none of this would have ever happened to me. Like that's how small it was to begin with. Mm. But that's not God's story that I get to play out. And, you know, when I was going through that journey, you know, I could be very upset with them, but it was a night shift. Goodness gracious. I can't imagine working a night shift. How tired must have they been? Like they were, they were getting through it, you know? And so, so how long did it take you to accept that, that this was God's story for you? I mean, uh, you obviously didn't walk out of the hospital and go, man, I feel this is great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there was a transition yeah. there somehow. There right? is a, so this is, this is the tricky part. And this is where I believe this is, you know, there's a verse in the book of Job, chapter 42, verse five, that says, all of my life, I've heard about you with my ears, but for the first time I've seen you with my eyes. And that verse has meant something. And my dad will share a story often that, you know, there's a time that, that we needed, desperately needed a machine to have a specific number on it. And it did not have that number on it. And they rallied around me and they laid hands on me and they prayed for me. And by the time that prayer was done, that machine had the number on it that it needed to have on it. And we can honestly say for the first time we saw God show up and save my life. So I've lived my whole life as that chameleon, but in the Christian side of things, I've lived my whole life telling people that God is good and, and, and trying to convince that people that God is good and, and talk people into having a relationship with him because he's good. And now that something traumatic is happening in my life, am I going to live my life now like he's not? Like that was the line in the sand for me. And, and I had to make that decision. Like, am I going to spend my whole life preaching and saying and trying to convince other people that God is good and, and now live life like he's not? Or am I going to spend my whole life saying that God is good and preach it and convince other people that God is good? And then something, something traumatic happens to me and I'm still going to do everything I possibly can to live my life. Like he's really, really, really still really good. Uh, and, and the verse that came to me again, and I say supernaturally because I, it doesn't make sense to me at all how I can get this. And I promise you, I am not in any way some super Christian that's going to give you this Christianese language and these Sunday school answers. But, but I remember being in the hospital room just before they wheeled me on March 18th, just before they wheeled me into surgery to cut off both of my hands. I remember looking at my family and, and uh, this is, this is the, uh, this is the harder part, but you know, there's a verse and again in the book of Job and uh, like, if you've never read the book of Job in the Bible, don't, it's awful. It's horrible. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, read your Bible people. If you're listening. Um, but in the book of Job, and this is one of those verses that I think whether you're a Christian or not, you know, people can, they've heard this verse or they can recite this verse, but you know, it says in Job 121 that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And for 39 years of my life, the Lord gave me hands and legs. Um, and at that time, it was just time for him to take away. Uh, and so I can't be okay with him giving me everything I need and then not be okay with him also taking away what he needs to take away. Uh, and praise God that that verse doesn't end there because it goes on to say, but blessed be the name of the Lord. So whether he's giving or whether he's taking away, blessed be his name because he's really good and he doesn't make mistakes and he doesn't mess up on you. And society tells us every which way that we are messed up, that we're not tall enough, that we're not skinny enough, that we're not pretty enough, that we're not fast enough. I could go on and on and on and on and I can fill in the blank for, for you know, whoever's listening to this or, or, or watching this, you know, what they may be going through right now. But society is telling us that we're not making that happen. And, and Christ is saying, man, I got you. And I knew that this was going to happen and I planned for this and I'm not done with you yet. So that's where I'm at. He either didn't want me yet or he's not done with me yet. So I'm going to choose to believe he's not done with me yet. And I want to shout it from the rooftops and, and show people what it looks like to live and not just be alive. 
Well, there's somebody watching this right now who's just saying, yeah, but Gary, you don't understand my circumstance. Sure. Um, and they're, they're, they're not where you're at. Yeah. What, what, what would you say to them? I'm going to say that I know that one thing is true that I know and I will believe through and through is that at the end of the day, every single person has a struggle. Every single one of us are struggling with something right now. And if you're not, buckle up, right? It's coming. But that is our common theme and, and, and something that we can all link arms with is that we're all struggling with something. But the only difference between me and you right now is that my struggles are visible. You can see them. You can see my struggles. You can see how hard it is for me to pick up this drink and take a drink. But I get to stand and tell people that I'm going to be okay. I'm on prosthetics. I walked in here today. But what I do know is that anxiety in today's day and age is a very, very real thing. And depression is a very real thing. And eating disorders and finances and marriages and pornography. And again, I could go on and on and on with that as well. So, so yeah, I don't understand what a lot of people are going through, but I understand struggles. And I understand that we all have struggles. And what I've learned is that struggles and sin in our lives, I truly believe find its power when it's hidden, when when we keep it to ourselves, when we keep that mask on, when we keep uh, continued continuing to be that chameleon and pretending. Yeah, you know, I think I think the Christian anthem is these days. It's fine, right? Like, hey, how you doing? Oh, it's fine. Everything's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Like that. That's our go-to answer when people ask how we're doing or how things are going. It's fine, and and that's just simply not true. Mm-hmm. You know, I believe that there's anything on this planet we can we can find to argue about. We can argue about sports. We can argue about politics. Our interpretations of scripture. I think what it was a couple years ago, the whole world was arguing if a dress was blue or green or whatever that was like, we can find anything to argue about. But the only thing that you can't argue with me about is my personal story, my testimony, what, what Christ has done in and through me. And it's the only thing that I can't argue with you about because that's your story. So why can't we just go around talking about that? Mm -hmm. The good, the bad and the ugly. Like, Mm -hmm. so I encourage people who, who think, kind of how how this question started like you know I, I don't know what you're going through but i do know that the invisible struggles can kill you way more than the visible ones can so if it finds its power when it's hidden i beg people i urge people and and i and i i'm mean to people sometimes and and i like i pray that the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you can't even fall asleep tonight until you can roll over and call one person or text one person or talk to your spouse or somebody and just tell them what you're really struggling with. Take that mask off and just tell them what you're really struggling with, who you really are. And you see the power that that struggle and then that sin has in your life is diminished. It's not gone. It's still there. It's still a struggle, but it's lost its power inside of you because it's not hidden anymore. It's not growing inside of you. So if we can find that one person to be brave enough with and courageous enough with to risk it and tell them who we really are, man, I think this whole world can change and we can somehow once again be one nation under God when we can come together and just share with each other and be real. And and what I've learned through that is through the sharing of my struggles, I've never been more loved in my entire life instead of judged. And I've always thought for 39 years I would be judged for needing help and sharing my struggles. And I've never felt more loved. So if people can hear that and believe me and try it on, practice, like risk it with one person. And I promise you, I promise you, if you trust one person strong enough, you are going to feel way more loved than judged than ever before through your sin and through your struggles. So, so tell me, give me the, uh, give me the story as it, as it is today. Uh, what's life like today? Tell me about your family. Yeah. Tell me about the other side of all of this. This is, it's, it's been a whirlwind of a three years here, but, uh, you know, God, God wasn't done removing things from me when he took my hands and legs away. Um, uh, a year after I got out of the hospital, I became much more independent 
and I was able to do some things on my own again, you know, difficult, but I could do it. And, you know, it was at that time that unfortunately uh, my wife at the time decided to take another path. So now I'm, I'm home and, and I'm alone and I'm in my house by myself and, and the Lord has taken away again in my life. But blessed be his name because, you know, things are still moving. And, you know, there's that peace that just doesn't make sense, that passes all understanding, that it was, it was November 1st, and I'll never, ever forget it. It was November 1st of 2021 that, that I, I, I woke up and, and I was okay with, with most of the things that were going on. And, and then my kids started telling me, dad, when are you going to go on a date again? Like, I'm like, okay, well, who's going to choose me, you know, in this state, you know, I had that self pity woe is me you know pity party mentality but you know i put myself out there a little bit and and it it was wonderful and i gained some confidence but then it freaked me out too so then i stopped and i was like okay god if if you want to bring me somebody you're just gonna have to like drop them in my lap you know for me and and sure enough he did just that and and i i met this girl named jenna who is now Jenna Miracle, and that's her real name, not her uh, wife amputee <laughs> stage name either. But she is Jenna Miracle, and and we met, and you know I I am firsthand proof, if if I can say that, uh, firsthand proof of how fast life is fleeting, and then I I fell in love with her uh, instantly, and we just decided to go for it, and let's just again live and not just be alive. So so we went and got married. And we are married, and uh, you know I'm able to to travel and do this. Um, she is on the worship team at our church, and she sings, and and she uses her gifts and her talents, and and she has three children, and I have my four. So we call it the miracle circus in our home. Uh, the, the the beauty of that is is that we have synced up our our child sharing schedules. So every other weekend, it's just Jenna and I in the house. So we do get our sacred time in our in our ministry and, and we call it our ministry and in, instead of our marriage just because the, god has just given this to us so so every other weekend it, it's just us but then every other weekend i i need a babysitter of some sort we've got all, all nine of us are in the house so it's a lot <laughs> but it's uh it's a lot of fun too you know what's what's one more kid at that point you know they, they entertain themselves but our family is is rolling strong right now and we are moving in the right direction and um i am i'm back again like i mentioned back out on the football fields and the soccer fields and i'm coaching and and christ has just shown up for me in ways that i can't imagine and and Life is life is pretty amazing for me right now. Now, a lot of that is fake it till you make it on some point and on some level. Like I'm not, you know, gonna sit here and you know say every day has been great. You know, there are hard times, there are difficult circumstances, there are very tough situations that we put ourselves in. But but man, if Christ's promises are true, that His mercies are new every day, then I can make the proclamation that from here on out even through all these bad circumstances and situations, I'm going to have no more bad days as a whole from here on out. So that's kind of where all of this came from uh, leading up to the book and, and the title of the book and the subtitle. And it just has all fallen into place with Christ's story. So, so tell me about the title of the book, no more bad days. Yeah, it was, it, it was just something that, that came to me after I got out of the hospital, I, I just started thinking it was around that November 1st time frame. You know, I would say, October 31st, the day before the November 1st date that I just shared with you, the day before that October 31st Halloween was probably the darkest night in my entire life. If even through my medical, even through my 107 day journey in the hospital and getting my limbs amputated, October 31st was, was the darkest night of my life. It was Halloween, my first holiday without my kids because my wife at the time had, had moved on and and, and I have kids and their families showing up at my door, smiling and, and wanting candy, like having a great night. And I, I, I went outside and I, I unplugged everything and turned all the lights off and, and I just went to bed and you know, didn't want to wake up really at the end of the day. Um, but somehow by the grace of God, woke up on November 1st, smiling again and, and didn't know why, again, didn't make sense. But, 
but I knew at that moment, like I, it just forget it. Like if his mercies are new every day, then I can have no more bad days, even through life's curveballs. But no more bad days is not some, uh, you know, detachment of reality. It's like, it, it's not, you know, some false, just Christian statement. Like it's something that I am trying to fight for and, and live by like, gosh, like Christ is, Christ is good. He's crazy about me. He's in love with me. So with him in me and me and him, and if, if, if my identity is in Christ and, and he tells us, tells us in Galatians is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives within me. So it's not Gary Miracle that's sitting here today being able to talk to you and have these conversations. It's Christ in Gary Miracle that gives me the strength and the power to do that. And when I can live in Christ in Gary Miracle, then I can also have no more bad days. So that's where the title of the book came from, and that's what I hope people can can grasp onto as well. Well, Gary, thank you for stopping by. Uh, yeah. I've really enjoyed our time together. Thank you. And I wish you much success with the, uh, with the book. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for this platform. And thanks again, Gary. Thanks for stopping by the homestead. Now be sure to check out the music video, Say I Won't, if you haven't done so before. It really is truly inspiring. Plus, of course, go get uh, Gary's book, No More Bad Days by Gary Miracle. This has been ContagiousInfluencers.com from the producers of Keep the Faith, the number one faith-based show in all of America. Do check out KeepTheFaith.com. Whoa, have we got some goodies for you there. It's uh, It's got a brand new look. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a fun site, and you're going to find all kinds of good free things there for you at uh, KeepTheFaith.com. And, of course, our podcast uh, website is at contagiousinfluencers.com and uh, please do check that out and do rate and review us. That that would be really cool if you give us five stars. That's how people uh, come about uh, finding us and because uh, uh, we spend no money in advertising people. We just, it's all word of mouth. So we really appreciate your help. Uh, until next time, I'm David Sams. Go out there this week and live that life in living color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living it in black and white. See you next time.